Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! We're back again. Yeah, well, hopefully it's going to be like, uh, we don't have to make a big deal out of it every time now. I think we've. we've I don't know, man. Point. I feel like it still needs to be a big deal every time. Yeah. Well, happy to have you. <laughs> I am happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know how we're going to proceed through this tonight. I mean, it, <clears throat> we don't often have exactly a plan. Like, we have some things that we want to talk about. Yeah. And sometimes we order them, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes and, we order them and don't follow the order. Well, every time we order them, we don't follow the order. That <laughs> oh, well. that has not worked out yet, yet. which is why <laughs> we don't always order them. Yeah. Um, there's really only one thing to talk about, though. Yeah. Uh, right now. So sorry, those of you that were tuning in to hear us talk about Michael Flynn. Yeah. Um, that's going to continue to be relevant, but not this week. <laughs> yeah, there's just too much else going on right now. I mean, I think, I've, dude, I, I think the Flynn deal is a huge deal and mm-hmm. it's something that deserves a lot of time being spent on. Yeah. But I mean, well, there you are know, the funny on thing. The street, so. <laughs> yeah. The, the funny thing is that it, it actually is directly relevant to this. I mean, we're talking about the overstep of law enforcement authority. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's again what that's we're talking about. Absolutely what that <clears throat> was. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, I don't know. I'm. You figure out something to say while I take a sip of my drink because I haven't even <laughs> taken a sip of my drink since I made it. Oh well, we're. Oh, you haven't even tried your drink yet, man. So we'll have to have Mike tell everybody what he's drinking on when he finishes taking a sip. Mm. Refreshing. Um, it's. Well, I've had it on the podcast before, but it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, it's called a White Lady cocktail. It's a gin cocktail. Um, it is gin, lemon juice, and uh, triple sec, or was, some kind of orange liqueur. It looks very refreshing. Yeah, I use Cointreau because <laughs> ah. Cointreau is the best. Oh, it looks good. I'm just drinking whiskey. So yeah, no, um, no fancy cocktail for me. Usually, I make it with uh, Plymouth Navy Strength, uh, oh, yeah. which is I don't remember 100 and something proof. <laughs> um, <laughs> Very like a, like 120 proof or something. It's yeah, it's it's pretty pretty up there. Um, I am not using Navy Strength right now because, like I t- like I said last week, yeah. you can go to the ABC store, you tell them what you want. I said I would like Plymouth Navy Strength gin, and then they brought it and checked me out before I even saw the bottle. And when I got it home, I pulled it out, and it was not Navy Strength; it was the regular strength. Oh man! <laughs> yeah, I said very clearly Navy Strength, and this is another one of the problem of having somebody else pick out your liquor for you. You have got to pay attention to what bottle they bring you. Well, I can't. I can't even see. Oh, you can't see it when they check it out. I mean, probably I, I could have. This was from uh, the first time I went in there, not last week when yeah. I bought this. Um, last week I probably could have. Yeah. But when I went in there before, they took it into that corner uh, checkout thing, like handed it from uh, from across the counter, and it was already like in bags before I got up close enough to oh man <laughs> to really see. And oh, well. the the bottles look the bottles are the same shape and color and everything too. So I would have to be looking like almost directly at the label. Yeah, uh, there's a slight difference in the color of the label. I mean, you know, oh well, take- it's still good. It's just not. It's just not as good. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have the full, it's not the full flavor. Right. right. <laughs> or the full alcohol content, which right. is really the issue. Which is, yeah, right. <laughs> but it mixes well with the lemon juice. I mean, like I said, this one's good and it, it's really refreshing, but there's like a, um, I don't know, I guess you get kind of more of the botanicals of the gin yeah. with the, the higher proof version. Like it comes through the cocktail better. It tastes more like pine trees. Gin doesn't taste like pine trees. You're <laughs> Gin crazy. Gin tastes like pine trees, man. I don't you're, know what to tell you. <laughs> you're crazy, man. Gin is great. And I will also, just for the record, because we're on the record here. Yes, we are. I, I will point out that every gin cocktail I've ever made you, you've said was really good. Hey, I, I, I don't have a problem with gin cocktails, but gin on its own tastes like pine trees. Well, I don't drink gin on its own. But it, oh. it even, I mean, but I have. It doesn't taste like <laughs> pine trees. Whatever. We're moving on. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving on. Um, so, obviously, the big news is uh, is riots all over the place. Dude, everywhere, um, including our little neck of the woods over here. Yeah. Well, and I think that, so, because there's a lot of problems with this 
of people uh, conflating these two different things. There, there are there is a difference between rioters and protesters. Agreed. Um, there are. Uh, so you, you have to keep in mind that more than one thing can be true at the same time, yeah. right? Um, there are people that are taking advantage of the situation to get things that they want or things that they need. Yeah. Um, but there are also people that are like legitimately out there trying to, uh, pressure, um, governments into making some changes. Yeah. And, and that I fully support, like I say. I mean, I think mm-hmm. there's all kinds of problems with the way policing is done right now. Yeah. Um, and and for everyone, not just, I mean, obviously the focus is, and we may get into this a little bit later, but obviously the focus is the way that, that the black community is treated by law enforcement. But quite frankly, I mean, while I agree that, that's pro- that there's probably a lot to be, a battle to be fought there, mm-hmm. I think the way the police treat Everybody is bad. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot to be said about that, too. Yeah. Well, I think the people that get the worst of it are the poor, white yeah. or black or Hispanic or whatever. That's um, true. I, I think that, you know, like a lot of the stuff, that it's more of a socioeconomic issue than um, than a color issue. A um, not that there isn't racism. Oh. Uh, I'm sure that there is. But... I, I don't, I, this is not what we should be trying to, ch- okay, um, if anybody out there is involved with Black Lives Matter and they want some friendly advice, yeah, and this is where you start really upsetting people, yeah. um, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter tag doesn't generate the kind of support that you could get um, with an All Lives Matter tag yeah. um and I, I know that that upsets people that it like minimizes things and to me the you know black lives matter is uh, as, as an acceptable phrase while all lives matter isn't um is the same thing to me as when you start talking about um uh, you know gay rights or uh black rights or women's rights or whatever like no we all have the same rights Absolutely. Like when you start defining these little subgroups, you start creating the little subgroups. It's it's you know language matters, and as long as we're on that, because I'm thinking about it right now, um, but I find it interesting that we always talk about the criminal justice system, and that mm-hmm. immediately biases you against whoever's trying to defend themselves from it, yeah. because what it should just be is the justice system, right? Yeah. Like if you call it the criminal justice system, you presuppose that the people involved are criminals. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the language does matter. And I think that you would make more progress if you didn't make it a racial thing, if you made it about police abuse. Yeah. Um, because like and people from all, I don't have a problem focusing on the abuse against minorities or black people. I mean, I don't, mm-hmm. but it, I don't have a problem focusing on that, but I don't want to ignore the rest. Yeah. It is kind of where I'm at with it because there's plenty to go around. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, I don't think it's as much of a race issue as it is we need to fix the cops. Yeah. Well, and I think it's that we need to fix the legal system in In general. Oh, I agree. Um, well, but it starts with the cops, but you're right. I mean, it's... it's no, I, I, so I disagree with that. I okay. don't think that it starts with the cops. Yeah. Um, I, the cops are the enforcement arm of the state. Absolutely. So that's where that's where the rubber meets the road, as it were, I suppose. But yeah. um, the problem is is above that. Like, all of yeah. these politicians that are out there, um, you know, taking their moment in the spotlight to talk about how they side with the, you know, the poor oppressed people and whatever it is that they happen to... Whatever platitudes they happen to be peddling right now. Yeah. Um, they're, they're at fault. These are the people that make these laws that are being enforced and you, you've created, um, and like, I'll go through a list of things, you know, before we end this, that I think that you could change that would have a huge impact on the, the end result here. Um, but one of them, um, is the drug war, Uh, just as an example. That's a big one. Cause you create all these laws that, that, uh, that promote um, proactive policing. Yeah. A lot of P's in that. Um, promote p- hope the proactive <laughs> policing. Yeah. If, I, if I'm positioned wrong, I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, and it creates a bunch of antagonistic, like unnecessarily antagonistic interactions between the police and the people. Yeah. Um, and this kind of thing is what 
is what creates the, like initiates the problem. But then like a whole lot of it too, though, is just how the legal system is set up. It does. And this is why the, the socioeconomic class is the bigger issue Um, because the poor people can't afford to defend themselves. Um, And so uh, almost any interaction that ends in arrest or, uh, or detainment can't be challenged by people that are poor because the legal system costs too much to get involved with. Yeah. Oh, I absolutely agree with all of that. So, I don't know. All right. No follow-up. You you make a good point. (laughs) Why, thank you. I try. Um, But especially the war on drugs, like that, you, you, especially as far as that goes, because that's (laughs) one of the biggest things I think that is the problem with the way we police now, anyway. Yeah. Is, is there's, that's really the main driver that, that drives police to do gives them, opens them doors to do a lot of the things that they do to, to overreach. Yeah, and it creates an economic incentive for them as well with yeah. the... Um, and I don't know that the individual police see it that way. It's just a power trip for them. I mean, it's, I mean the cop that pulls the guy over that wants to arrest somebody for weed isn't doing it because it's going to... He's doing it because he wants to help his career. Well, and, but the asset forfeiture gives them... A lot a of way. opportunity to do that. Yeah, it gives them uh, a way to help their career. But I'm just yeah. saying, like, the cop on the beat, that's not their motivation. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... Well, there are no cops on the beat anymore, well, and that's part yeah. of the problem, I think. Yeah. Um, although I didn't list it among my things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do think that's part of the problem. I mean, we talked last time about that they, there has been a shift from being peace officers to law enforcement officers. Yeah. <clears throat> And so, um, I, I mean, you know, that's that's certainly a big part of it. Uh, e- economics is a big part of it. Uh, the lack of accountability is the the big part of it. And I, I guess as long as we're on this, I'll just I'll give you my five things. Yeah. Um, so, and we can take these one by one. But I'm going to go ahead and list them right Let's here. Put at the them beginning. out on the table. <laughs> um, in the doctrine of qualified immunity. Okay. All right. So, like, most of this is like the first, at least the first couple of things are about accountability. So, in the doctrine of qualified immunity. Uh, restore the right to resist. Yeah. These are things that have changed in the last essentially 50 years through judicial activism um, that used to keep police in check because because they were beholden to the people in some respects, which they're not anymore. Oh, in no way, shape, or form. Um, yeah. But they're supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, you got the Dave Smith, and we'll bring Dave Smith in here later. I yeah. actually have a clip from him that I thought was really good. But, um, you know, we got his joke from his... Uh, his stand-up special um, where, you know, he's people telling him that the police work for you. And he's like, yeah, try and exercise that sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go down to the local <laughs> precinct and see how that goes. Yeah. Um, so, and then the, the next things are just about, uh, I guess it's as much about assets or as anything else. Um, but in the drug war yeah, um, and in the terror war. Oh Yeah. Because that's where you get all of your surveillance in from. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's and your equipment. You've militarized yeah. the police everywhere on leftovers from the army because it's really easy to spend taxpayer money to buy the army all new stuff every couple of years. And yeah. what are you going to do with all that extra? We've been at war for for twenty years. Actually, yeah. we've been at war for seventy years, but yeah. um, essentially. Yeah. But like uh, the last twenty has been something special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last thing is is the blue wall of silence yeah. issue. Um, and it, it just, uh, makes it so that good people don't become cops or they don't stay cops very long. And, uh, if you don't have good people as cops, then what do you have left? Yeah, exactly. What we have now. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm always torn on these things because I grew up in a law enforcement family. Yeah. It, it's not that I don't have any respect for law enforcement. I, and I understand the importance of those people coming home every night because yeah. I damn sure wanted my dad to. Absolutely. Um, but there's limitations and, and actually, I'm gonna tell. I, I'm gonna get some of this wrong, but um, I'm gonna tell a story from from him. Now, my father was FBI, um, and on a drug bust, uh, he was he was SWAT team here yeah. um, down here. And uh, on a drug bust, they uh, you know did a SWAT raid, knocked down some guy's door at seven o'clock in the morning or something, because they go in the morning because you know most of the people involved in those kind of activities are up all night and then they sleep. Sleep, you know, they're all sleeping day. in the morning. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, they, they bust down the door and the guy was, uh, he was on meth or crack or something anyway. So he's like actively doing drugs, sitting on a couch that's facing the doorway with a coffee table in front of him and his drugs and a pistol. 
and he fired at them as they came in. Like oh, he sure. grabs the pistol and he fires at the the FBI SWAT team as they come in the front door. They yeah. did not kill this guy. They didn't even shoot at him. Really? Yeah. They um, just like subdued him or whatever. Yeah. Or? Well, he ended up. Well, he's like he grabbed the gun and fired and then he ran. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, he ended up like crawling up into the crawl space above a ceiling in some room in the house or whatever. And they spent an hour trying to talk him down yeah. um, because he was like going on about how they were going to kill him. And they pretty much told him if they were going to kill him, they would have done it when they shot at him. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. That, um, that moment passed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, the point is that like, okay, shooting at people for throwing rocks is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, shooting at people as they're running away is not acceptable. Yeah, um, but never. you know, it, and here's a case where they sh- you know, the, the suspect shot at the police as they came in the door. They had, you know, they yeah. had their guns in their hands as a SWAT. It's not raid. like they couldn't have responded to yeah, that. But they didn't. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and I say that it's not, I, and it's not that I don't know. I was sent you that video with the guy throwing the brick oh, yeah. uh, the other day. Um, but uh, so it's not that I don't realize that throwing rocks is dangerous or throwing bricks is dangerous. <laughs> it was for the guy in the video, by yeah. the way. If y'all hadn't seen it, it's the one where the guy walks in front of the other guy going to break into some business. And yeah, the guy throws the brick and hits his friend right in the head with it. <laughs> and he went down like a sack of potatoes. Yeah, dude. he did. It wasn't. Yeah, that was that was a full on brick hit. <laughs> yeah, I, I said it was kind of scary. That guy could be dead. He could be. Um, But. You know, especially in these situations where you've got the police out there in full riot gear. They've got helmets and face shields and body armor and so forth. You know, a rock's really not... I mean, I know they can hit you in just the right place. Oh, yeah. But a rock's not really that dangerous. Now, if they're throwing Molotov cocktails, that's a different story. Absolutely. I I understand shooting somebody down that's about to throw a Molotov (laughs) cocktail at you, but somebody throwing a rock is not a danger to you. Not a significant enough danger to warrant using... And to me, it all goes back to a basic principle of self-defense. Like -hmm. like you say, like the Molotov cocktail is a problem, but the guy just like causing a ruckus or whatever, you know, maybe not as much. Maybe we don't need to use that type of force against. You yeah. Know? I don't know. I just feel like it should be, be, you know, portion out based off the threat, you know? Yeah. Well, and it, and it should, but, and the other thing, I guess my point is as much as anything here is that the police are in a position with, where they're just much better protected. Yeah. All those guys are wearing body armor. They didn't, they, they should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you're not, that's just stupid. Yeah. It's your own fault. <laughs> yeah, right. Personal. Um, once again, personal mm, responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the police are in a position which where they're better protected and better armed, generally speaking. And I know that the uh, the really well armed police force goes back to the string of bank robberies in L.A. back in the '80s or whenever. Yeah. And oh, then there were some in Florida also. Same kind of thing. Really? Um, with uh, a couple of bank robbers that were wearing um, Kevlar and had uh, uh, assault rifles and that they had modified to be fully automatic and yeah. so forth. And the, you know, the police were trying to bring them. The LA one was the big one because the police were trying to, they ended up in a shootout in front of one of these banks that went on for a while yeah. um, because the police had their handguns and their shotguns and, and their rifles, but they didn't have anything that could penetrate the body on. And they were pinned, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I seem to remember, I, I've heard the story. I don't remember. So mm-hmm. I've said it's before my time, but. But my position on these things is that there are people that are better trained to handle that kind of thing and yeah. you contain and you keep them in Wait. place until yeah. those people arrive. Yeah. Organizations like the FBI. Yeah. Um, or the National Guard if it comes to that. But there's an <laughs> FBI office within uh, responding dif- distance of anywhere in this country pretty much where yeah. something like that would be a real danger. Yeah. Somebody um, can get there in time. Though. Yeah, I mean, they're certainly in every major city. If we got an FBI office in Mobile, well, Mobile's a major port, actually. I guess that's part of it too. But um, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, I, I'm pretty sure there, there's FBI offices in um, Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, or in Alabama. I, we're not a big state. That's mm-hmm. like you can get to the entire state within two hours from any of those offices. Well, I'm sure anywhere that or from have, one of those offices, you know, FBI would have, you know, National Guard or mm-hmm. you know somebody that they could call to be like, hey, we got a problem here. <laughs> we need we need a little help. <laughs> yeah. So. And the the worst thing about this is that like everybody's screwing this up right now. Yeah. Um. The the people that are out there rioting or screwing it up for the people that are out there that are that are protesting for good reason. Yeah. Um, Trump with 
his keep threatening to bring the military in is yeah. the wrong response. I tell you, that scares the crap out of me. <clears throat> um, maybe it shouldn't, but it me just too. it does. I well, mean. the Insurrection Act has been... It, and I've noticed that people are talking about this, like the Insurrection Act is, you know, yeah. this crazy idea. <laughs> and I, I don't think it applies here, yeah. really, but... Um, the Insurrection Act's been used like half a dozen times. Yeah, I want to say um, the last time was in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. The L.A. riots. Yeah. After the Rodney King Yeah, uh, thing. That's what I was thinking. That's what yeah. I had thought. Um, I don't know if that that was the last time, but I know that it was used then. Yeah, I, I, That was Clinton, I wanna, right? I yeah, mean, that was... Was it Clinton? 92? Or was it, was it H.W.? Yeah, it was still H.W., I yeah. guess. I'm thinking yeah. it was... I, I could be wrong about that, but I was thinking it was 92. So. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, I can't document, I, like I say, I don't, I'm just like off my memory. No, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, you know, that was a, the Insurrection Act has been used in response to rioting before. Yeah. Well, and, and fair enough, but just the whole idea of having <coughs> military, you know, on the streets of this country scares me. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, warranted or not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I agree. I don't like the idea um, at all. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to like it. I, so the, the rioting and so forth, the rioting and looting, and, and here's one of those things, right? Like, so what Trump said when he was threatening to bring the military out, yeah. like, I agree with a lot of what he said. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of that speech was about if, uh, if those of you that are running these cities and states can't Get effectively them under control yeah. yeah well it wasn't even that so much as if you can't effectively protect people's lives and property yeah i'll make sure that that those lives and property are protected yeah and i think that that i mean that is the responsibility of law enforcement yeah um oh agreed. so i i don't disagree entirely with what he what he said the reason was i just don't think that we reached a point where it's merited yeah. but um, and that's, you know, that's part of the problem here, right? Is that the, if you're trying to make changes and in a way this goes back to the identifying racism as the big problem instead of, you know, abuses by the police as a, the core problem. Yeah. Um, but if you go out there and you start looting, it evaporates any sympathy that anybody has for your cause. Yeah. Right. Like you, you lose all of that. You got people that are on the fence and even people that were on your side are suddenly like, now, wait a minute. Yeah. This is why we need police. <laughs> Somebody get the police out there, yeah. you know, to take control of this situation. Exactly. And like, I've seen some videos and I mean, I've, well, I've seen a lot of videos over the past couple of weeks. Have we all? Yeah. Where like the police are basically just letting this stuff go on because I mean, what are they going to do? You know, I mean, they're, they're overpowered anyway, and they and there's an understanding that people are angry, and so and and I mean I'm one of them. Like I get it. Like I I'm not happy with the situation either. Um, and you got to let people kind of release some of that frustration. But to me, it just shouldn't be done on people's private property. <laughs> like I mean, yeah, that's, that's yeah. You're focusing your anger in the wrong place here. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of it, as far as everybody screwing up, yeah. uh, police or, or military, if we get there, yeah. um, crackdowns, uh, all that does actually is just inflame the rebellion and reinforce the cause. So, yeah. you Absolutely. know, if you're out there complaining about police abuse and then the military comes in and starts shooting people, then that doesn't really calm things down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, it only escalates it. Um, what, you know, Jim Morrison said, right? Like they got the guns, but we got the numbers. Yeah. Some of us have guns too, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of us have both. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, but, but you lose, like you were saying though, as far as the numbers though, you lose a lot of people with a lot of this because a lot of, a lot of people that was going to support you won't. Yeah. You well, know? Yeah, uh, and as a result of both of those things, because you know the the people that are out there because they think they've got a good cause to fight for aren't going to fight for your looting. Yeah. Um, and the the people that are just out there LARPing are going to go home when the when the <laughs> military shows up. Oh, absolutely. Um, so in a sense, I guess it could bring an end to this, but it it won't. Yeah. 
it won't solve the problem. It won't fix anything. Yeah, yeah. we're just going to end up right back here the next time somebody gets shot and killed by the police. Exactly. And well, the, the next if, time a black well, man gets shot and killed well, by the police and because I was fixing the, to say, the media. Next time the media picks up on it. Right. Because let's remember, this happens all the time. Yeah. It's just not this specific situation. Yeah, and, I posted that article on our Facebook page the other day that in the first five months of 2020, 400 people have been killed by police in the U.S. Yeah. That is a, 400 people. That is a big number. I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah. Man. that That's... On average, eight in every state. <laughs> yeah. Well, and on top of that, you got to figure a lot of these people were like. It like, sounds like are, less when I say it that way, doesn't well, it? But yeah, but even <laughs> still, though, you got to figure there's that was all during the Corona thing. So I mean, if they killed that many with us on lockdown with Corona for two of those months, for two of those months, yeah. I mean, figure what those numbers have been if we had had like full freedom. Yeah. You know. Yeah, um, that's that's absolutely true. I, so let's go let's go back and take these things bit by bit. Sure. Um in qualified immunity. So qualified immunity is this I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on qualified immunity here. If you want to learn more about qualified immunity, go back to our uh the the Liberty Mike episode thirteen is about a year ago called To Protect and Serve. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of uh lot of interesting information about how the the police through um, various court cases have have no responsibility to protect you. Yeah. Except, actually, interestingly enough, I, I'm gonna. Sorry, I'm going on a little tangent no, here. Do it. Um, Let's except tangent. when you're in police custody. Yeah. So like then. George Floyd was. <laughs> so, so, like that specific situation. <laughs> yeah. They were required to protect him. Yeah, they have a responsibility to protect him when yeah. he's in police custody. Yeah. Interesting. But um, the, the qualified immunity doctrine is a result of judicial activism in the last 50 years, roughly, um, that has made this decision outside the law, I would say. Yeah. That um, the police uh, essentially aren't accountable um, unless there is a specific statute that, uh, that expressly forbids whatever it is that they did um, and the way it's been interpreted is that the details have to be exactly the same as some previous case, essentially. Right. And since every situation is unique in its own way, yeah. um, it, what it, what it comes down to saying is that, you know, it's entirely up to the police, what they do in any particular situation and they can't be prosecuted for it. Yeah. I, I really recommend everybody <clears throat> go back and listen to that episode because I'm remembering now that we're talking some of the stuff we talked about in that episode. Mm -hmm. That is a good episode for people to listen to, especially right now with everything going on. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying it really is. Yeah. I think it was roughly July of last year that we put that yeah. out. Well, you said it was episode 13. Right? Episode 13. It's easy enough to go through the thing and find episode 13. Yeah. And it would be even easier if anybody would answer my call that knows how to do a website better than I can so that we can <laughs> split these things up and make them easier to find. Yeah. But it is at least in um, chronological order, like yeah, reverse chronological yeah, order. Yeah. So, so I mean, scroll all you down. you gotta do is go, scroll down. And like I said, that, I, like I said, thinking back on what we talked about in that episode, it's, it's worth going and listening to because there's some pretty outrageous stuff that we talk about that happened mm -hmm. due to this exactly what we're talking about. So, yeah. So in the doctrine of qualified immunity, make it so that police don't feel like they can get away with anything. Yeah. That's, that's a, a, Big step in the right direction. Absolutely. To creating accountability. And if people are accountable to their actions, then they, they're they more measured. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, restore the right to resist. Yeah. Now, this is, this, is, this is old, old, old. Yeah. The right to resist. Um, but again, it's been um, kind of dissolved through judicial activism in the last 50 or so years, um, starting with the uh, civil rights well, movement. I will tell you that you want to do something to really fix a lot of the law enforcement problems we have. That would be one of the ways to do it to to in the give people back the right there is this because there would be a lot less cops trying to arrest you and do bogus stuff 
mm-hmm. if they knew that you had the right to refuse when they were wrong. Yeah, and that you could prosecute them for it. Yeah, I mean, you would. It would go a long <laughs> way to to end a lot of the things that go on right now. Yeah. So the right to resist is a is a carryover from English common law in this country. It's like five hundred years old or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, and it essentially says that uh, that your liberty. And your life and liberty are of the utmost importance. And it gives every citizen the right to resist unlawful arrest. Yeah. By any means necessary yeah. to protect their own liberty, <laughs> life, and property. Exactly. Um, and and it's, a, it's about uh, just preventing the free exercise of power. Yeah. Um, and if you think back to the founding of this country, you understand why that was a part of it. Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely. <clears throat> um, but I'll tell you something. That's one... You'll never see that because the law enforcement has too big an influence and would never allow something like that. Yeah, I think you're right. And Unfortunately, but I'm telling you, as as far as like something that that some of these groups should get behind, that should be it. That's what we should be talking yeah. about. Well, if you could get the courts to side with you, the problem is that the courts and the law enforcement work for the same people. Exactly, which is how we ended up here to begin with. Right. Um, so, and I'm going to try and tell this little story about right to resist. Um, I I did, I I read it to Liberty Larry right before we got on. And what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to post the article from, uh, William Norman Grigg from a few years back where he details this particular event. Um, but I'm going to try and tell it as best I can, (laughs) (laughs) uh, from memory here. Although, like I said, I just did read it, but I was reading out loud. So anyway, um, And it's about uh, this guy, Julius Holmes. Um, He's a black man in Macon County, Georgia. And he he had a white police officer in his home attempting to arrest him uh, for a misdemeanor that had been reported the previous day. And um, and Julius Holmes says that he's, you know, he's essentially like... uh, um, Wyatt Earp in Tombstone, uh, yeah. when, uh, Sheriff Bean comes up to him or not, uh, Sheriff, uh, the Marshal, um, comes up to him and says that he's under arrest. And he says, I don't think I'm going to let you arrest me today. If you guys have seen that movie. <laughs> All right. So that's essentially what he does. Yeah. And he tells the, um, the officer, he's like, you present me a summons. I'll come down to the courthouse in the morning. Yeah. Um, and the officer refuses to do that and calls for backup um, they get, you know, he gets reinforcements there. They drag the guy out of his home. Um, he, uh, manages to free himself from them, runs back inside, uh, grabs a shotgun and then goes running out the back essentially like, um, <laughs> to flee towards the woods. Now in, as things are developing here, a little crowd has formed, um, and another white man in the crowd decides he's going to be officer friendly himself and goes chasing after, uh, Julius Holmes. Um, and, uh, and Julius Holmes shoots him. Yeah. Uh, this is after, by the way, one of the officers actually shoots him as he's trying to get away too. Yeah. Um, but, uh, shoots Julius Holmes, not the guy that was trying to, to do the citizens arrest or whatever. Yeah. Trying to stop him. The guy that deputized himself. So. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, but Julius Holmes ends up shooting and killing this guy who deputized himself and went chasing <laughs> after him too. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, he's been injured by the, the police officer. And so they end up catching him and arresting him. Um, and he's, uh, he's, uh, convicted of murder. Um, when it goes to the Georgia court of appeals though, they overturn that murder. Um, and they, what they did was they cited the doctrine of, of, uh, or the right to resist. They cited right to resist. They said that, um, there wasn't a warrant. Uh, the, the police had time to get a warrant. They could have gotten a bench warrant at the, if they needed to, um, they chose to do none of these things. Uh, it wasn't a lawful arrest and that Julius Holmes had every right to resist the arrest and do everything in his power to maintain his own in his own Liberty. Um, and that, that right was, you know, conferred on anybody. Uh, yeah. All citizens have this right. And they also said that it was a justifiable uh, homicide for them, for him to kill the guy that went chasing after him. Yeah. Um, and they also added that <laughs> if he had ended up shooting one of the police officers, that that would have been that a justifiable been homicide as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that since they had no warrant, 
that he wasn't wanted for any state or federal crime, um, that essentially by entering his house, they were trespassing, and by trying to take him away, they were trespassing in another way. Yeah. Uh, and that he had the right to use every bit of force that he thought was necessary to maintain his own liberty. Yeah. Um, and and the punchline of this story is that this happened in uh, in South Georgia in 1908. This <laughs> yeah. is this is Jim Crow era South yeah. with a white dominated uh, judicial system. Um, white officers trying to arrest a black man, and the court sided with him. That's how important the right to resist was to people at that yeah. time. Well, and something that you kind of left out when you were telling the story that I took note of when you were reading it to me is that there were multiple occasions where he would have been in today's and the the author points this out in the in the piece that where he would have been shot today where the first time he goes for the pistol he mm-hmm. would have been shot when he went for the shotgun he would have been shot like all of those he wouldn't have survived any of those encounters mm-hmm. in today's law enforcement yeah. um, and the fact that he did survive those encounters in that time period just goes to tell you what this that type of doctrine can do yeah you know and, and the value they placed on that idea yeah because they they knew that they were in the wrong with what they were doing and that's mm-hmm. the reason they didn't shoot him because yeah. they knew that they would have been held accountable for that yeah it's a it, it was a it was a protection against arbitrary authority. Exactly. Um, and uh, there was another court case, and I can't remember the specifics of that one, but where in the um, in the opinion they pointed out that the uh, that an officer trying to uh, place an arrest unlawfully um, has the power to do it. Uh, like yeah. they identify the difference between yeah. power and authority. Yeah. Um, that the officer has the power to do it, but that the citizens have the authority to resist it. Yeah. And so this is another one, just like create accountability, create a a position where the police have to do things right. Well, and that's the best way to fix this problem for everybody is to create. And that's part of what that's part of why people are in the streets now is because they don't feel like there's any accountability. And you can talk to the protesters that are out there right now. They'll tell you that the reason they're out there is because they don't think there's any accountability that cops can just go kill black people Mm -hmm. Unimpeded, and they're and in a lot of ways they're not wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, it, except that the cops can go kill anybody. Unimpeded. The, the truth is, they can do it to anybody. <laughs> yeah. is is and really, they have and have absolutely. And that's so. If you want, if if you truly want to look for solutions to this problem, I mean, we've just I don't know. I feel like we've just laid a pretty good one out. Yeah. Um, um, in the drug war, we talked about that one already, oh, yeah. uh, that, that just creates a whole bunch of antagonistic, proactive policing, um, yep. just creates friction between the police and the community, which is yep. a problem. Um, in, in the terror war, we talked about that a bit too, mostly just because of the supply thing, right? Yep. Like, um, this is a huge business for some people in this country and, uh, they can keep spending your money to buy this stuff for the military. And then as the military passes it down after a couple of years, then it just gets distributed to the police. I mean, there are, um, military grade weapons in the hands of just about every federal agency. And I mean... Yeah. Just about every federal agency, including the Department of Education, the yeah. Department of Agriculture. Yeah. I, I mean, like the list of federal agencies that have access to this weaponry is unreal. Yeah. It's, and it makes no sense. Yeah, like, why do they need that? No sense whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I think we mentioned it last time that there's something like 5,000 SWAT raids a year in this country. Yeah. 5,000 SWAT raids a year. Yep. Uh, that's That's... There's no, there's no reason for that. I mean, there's just not. Um, and and to make the drug argument is just, it just feels like we're so past that in this country. And I mean, clearly I'm wrong about that because it's still happening. But it it just it feels like the people of this country are past that. You know. I hope so. I, I've well, <laughs> I, and I hope we get there. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, this. I think this was a step in the right direction in terms of waking people up. I hope so. Um, I do think that there's a lot of people out there protesting that are out there LARPing, though. <laughs> there are. Oh, I'm, I'm, there's no question. <laughs> I think that there's a, a whole bunch of, you know, um, really white kids uh, yeah. primarily that are out there because this seems like fun. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and we've all been cooped up in the house for so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to go get out and be part of public again. Yeah. Throw some bricks, man. <laughs> right. Throw some bricks. So. Um. 
so uh, yeah, ending the terror war. The the other thing it does is that I, I'm sure that this is a quote from somebody else, but maybe I just made it up. Let's hope that I made it up and it becomes a thing. There you um, go. That you can't maintain a state of war uh, for any significant period of time and maintain a moral culture. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about that before, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. Um, and then, so there's a whole bunch of uh, military guys. Th th another part of this is that there's a whole bunch of military guys that when they leave the military, they come back and they join law enforcement here in the U.S. Yeah. Now, I will point out that I think for the most part, the guys that have military service in their background are the better behaved police because they have a, a, a stronger discipline, yeah. um, I think, than the other police. But the uh, another... Uh, side effect of that is that the guys that didn't serve that are on the police are tr out there trying to play soldier boy. Yeah. Um, and this creates some of these problems as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then the last thing that I said is the, is the, we got to bring it into the blue wall of silence. Yeah. Um, this is a, a real problem and it, it is probably the biggest problem when it comes right down to it, because I really believe that most police are good. Yeah. I, I think mean, I the great majority yeah. of people are there for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate thing is that you get you get drummed out of the force if you speak out against uh, speak out about the bad behavior of another police officer. Yeah. And um, we just gotta stop. Uh, you know, the retribution for those kinds of complaints is is a problem. Yeah. Um, we need to. Uh, we need to react in the appropriate way when police start complaining about the bad behavior of other police. Yeah. The, the, the complainer is not the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but that's how it's treated oh, right absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's tons of stories of, uh, police officers that were speaking out against fellow officers, the, their behavior on the streets and, um, were run out of their, their police forces. Yeah. And and as I said before, if you drive out all the good guys, all that's left is the rest. Yeah. So. I mean, I hope. I, I think a lot of those things are easy to do. I think the yeah. blue wall of silence is actually probably the toughest to kind of drum yeah. out of people. But that's that's probably true because that's a, a cultural. Well, the thing is, is that ending the blue wall of silence is something that will take time. Like, it, yeah, I mean, that's that's something some of the stuff we talked about could be done right now, but the the blue wall of silence will take time. That's the only thing that will will fix that is kind of just letting letting things kind of evolve. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, if we could do the other things, essentially, then that the blue wall of silence would come to an end on its own. Is that well, kind of the idea? I, I or? think that's part of the idea. I mean, I think I mean, you have to change the culture in inside the departments. Mm -hmm. And and it just my my experience in, in management tells me that's just not something you do do quickly. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you it takes time of, of people leaving and new people coming in with fresh it just it takes time mm -hmm. it's just not something that you can do like on the spot yeah um yeah and that makes sense all right uh so let's circle back a little bit to the whole well a couple of things actually um let, let's circle back to the uh the looting and rioting aspect of this and then the racism aspect of this yeah. um i think I guess now's as good a time as any. This is going to, um, now's as good a time as any to throw this, uh, um, Dave Smith clip in. Oh, um, my man. <laughs> I'm actually just looking for a place to throw this clip in. Cause I, I think that we had one earlier and I didn't announce it. So <laughs> missed opportunity. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, and this also goes to show, all right. So he has a podcast called part of the problem which I highly recommend if you aren't afraid of some colorful language. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got a mouth on him. <laughs> oh, um, but it's, I, I don't know, I really, it's one I really enjoy listening to. The guy's mm -hmm. a comedian by trade, mm -hmm. so he's automatically just funny anyway. I don't know. Yeah, and he's very well read on the libertarian thing, so if you're looking for somebody to entertainingly um, help you understand some libertarian thought, like, yeah. 
in a funny way, L- entertaining in a different way than we are. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hope we're funny sometimes, but not, yeah. not yeah. like he. We're, we're not <laughs> Dave Smith, though. <laughs> not like the podcast that is uh, is hosted by two comedians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, part of the problem. Check it out. But he had this uh, this great little bit on his show. I can't remember. It was last week or early this week. Anyway, so here you go. The state is a threat to our liberty, um, but the mob is an equal threat to li- uh, liberty and a bigger threat to any sense of order at all, which is also important, you know? So like, uh, because you can have basically no liberty in complete chaos. All right. And I think he's absolutely on top of things there, right? Um, the Both the uh, the authorities and the um the mob are a threat to liberty yeah all right <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly <laughs> and and like we said earlier this is the problem with the that kind of violent reaction from the people and yeah. sometimes uh, there is a reason for violence like and i've seen the videos as much as anybody else um with the police being uh, using physical force more than they should in these situations. Yeah. I've seen the drive by pepper spraying and all that <laughs> stuff. I mean, yeah, I saw that. kind of unreal, yeah. but there are some people that are just opportunist yeah. in the situation and mob rule is at least as scary to me. Oh, and I also want to point out th- that like me, Dave Smith is also an anarchist. Yeah, I was so I was fixing the I was fixing the say I was like, yeah, you got to remember who you're talking to here with this guy because that guy is an anarchist. Like, there's no yeah. no two ways about it. I mean, anarchist, volunteerist maybe, but <laughs> no, I think he would describe himself as an anarchist, and I would I yeah. would do the same um, for I'm, myself. And it just goes back to the whole idea that anarchy is not. It's no not, rules. It's no rulers. Well, yeah, and our, well, the the media particularly right now, and you know, I was watching some of the vid, not videos, but just some of the coverage the other day, and they kept making references that well, you got to remember, some of these people are just anarchists. Like there's there's a group of people out here that all they want to do just is see create, the world burn is watch the world burn, and they're anarchists. I was like, man, like those are not anarchists. Like I know plenty of anarchists and that's not what they are. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's hard to take them seriously though. Cause I'm sure that you saw the clip too, where the guy's going on about the peaceful protesters and buildings burning down behind him. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Those peaceful protesters, they lit that fire. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Anyway, um, it's been interesting listening to the media coverage of this because yeah. the word uh, the word peaceful has probably been used in the media more in the last week than it has in the last decade yeah because this is we're clearly a country that doesn't actually care about peaceful very much yeah um as evidenced by the fact that we are still at war like we have active military operations in something like 40 countries that's 20 percent of the world good night or 20 percent of the countries in the world countries, anyway yeah. yeah maybe not land area but still yeah still way too many yeah and and they're criticizing trump for trying to end the war in afghanistan or withdraw troops from syria or what have you and this is something else that's really bothered me i really resent being put in a position where i have to defend that bastard but i it, over and over and over again i'm put in a position where i have to defend that bastard yeah um so you know we got the the whole covid situation where uh you know it's all trump's fault somehow and i'm going to say it again and again and again and again yeah a government no government can protect you from a virus yeah it wouldn't have mattered if hillary clinton was in power it doesn't matter the government cannot protect you from a virus. There is nothing that Trump could have done to keep people from getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> and there's it's just it's the same way that not, there was nothing China could do to stop the spread. Because trust me, the China did they not, locked down they more locked, than we could. Oh yeah, they locked down a lot harder than we could, and they couldn't stop it. Yeah. So I mean, that just goes to show you, like, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. And this whole this reaction isn't Trump's fault nearly as much as I would say it's the media's fault. Oh, it's like, absolutely the media's fault. I'm not saying that Trump doesn't fan the flames because he's oh yeah. that's who he is. Yeah, but incendiary in, language. Yeah, right? we but, we and everybody knows who he is. Like that's that's what he's he a does. New Yorker. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the the media is responsible here. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, and they, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that they keep talking about um, how, uh, you know, he's just inflamed the the race uh, tensions in this country. And I, there's not a whole lot that he's said, actually, at least in context. And like, let me make that clear, yeah. at least in context that has really fanned the flames of racism in this country. It's the way he's been covered over the last four years oh, yeah. um, by the media. I mean, the whole, um, you know, Mexicans are rapists and thieves or whatever, like that was taken way out of context. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many situations where things that, oh, of course, the big one is the Charlotte one, right? Like, there oh, were good yeah. people on both sides. <laughs> but if you play that clip for about another 30 seconds... He says, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis. They're terrible people or something yeah. like that. Oh, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> so it, anyway, the, the media has had a huge influence on this. And the idea that, um, that Trump is a divider and Obama was a unifier is just beyond my understanding. Yeah. Obama had plenty of opportunities to, uh, to unite people and kind of dispel racism. But in, at every opportunity, he took that situation and made it worse. And I can't think of specific examples right now, but I remember so many situations where there was a race question that came up while Obama was president. Yeah. And instead of trying to bring people together, he just reinforced the whole idea that there's, you know, different classes of people. There's two classes of people here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember the same thing going through in those times, and it is amazing to me because the media is all on that narrative now that yeah. you know o Obama would have handled this so much better. Like I can't get it's constant. <laughs> I don't think so. I think Obama would have uh, would have exaggerated the the racial elements of this. Yeah. Um, would have really uh, uh, pushed the black communities into making more like into being more active in this um, and would have blamed white people that much more. Yeah. I mean, that was my, and, that was my memory of Obama. Yeah. And, and I, let me, let me also remind everyone here that I don't like any of these people. <laughs> yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Like I'm not on Trump's side either. Neither of these guys <laughs> are on my team, <laughs> but, and I despise George W. Bush. Oh Yeah. <clears throat> no question about that. But like I say, at the end of the day, the big thing here is my my big, the thing I want people to take away from this podcast today, at least for my mind, is that we, we could accomplish a lot of the goals and a lot of the stuff that we talked about here today by bringing people together. Um, and the media is intentionally pushing people apart, pushing these groups apart and pitting them against each other. Yeah. When if, because if we all work together, everybody, we could get some of the stuff done. Yeah. But we're not going to get there playing these race games. I yeah. mean, we're, we're just not. Um, and, and it's, it's the, the same thing is going to continue and we're never going to get where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Remember and remind your politicians that this is a government of, by, and for the people, all the people. Yeah. Um, and that's what it's supposed to be all about. And, and then, you know, I, I get so frustrated watching this political maneuvering, yeah. particularly right now from Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, I, well, I would say particularly right now from, uh, from Trump and Biden. I mean, yeah. as we're like running into the camp, excuse me, the campaign season, I watched Biden go on and on about systemic racism the other day. And um, this is what I have to ask Joe Biden. So if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, what system are you talking about? Yeah, because it's not the economic system. The economic system isn't racist, um, or there would be no rich black people. Yeah, and there are plenty of rich black people. Yes, there are. Right, and in fact, at the top of the economic system in this country are Asian people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> who also were brought, uh, like, uh, there were a whole lot of Chinese that were brought over here as slaves um, for the railroad building. I, I don't know if people are aware of that particular aspect of American culture, but it yeah. wasn't just black people that were slaves here. And white people were brought over here as slaves, too. You ever heard of indentured <laughs> servitude? That's all beside the point. We need to leave that alone for now. For we'll now. address we'll that on another, <laughs> another day. Yeah. Um, but 
So uh, what system exactly are you talking about? The only system that can enforce its values on other people is the government system. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Joe Biden. Yes. You're complaining about systemic racism, presumably the government systemic racism. You have been a part of this government for 50 years, yep, including eight years under a black president in this country. <laughs> right. Why is it still a problem? Yeah. If you have the answer, <laughs> well, you've had half a century and eight years under a black president to enact whatever you think the answer to this problem is. And what did he enact? I don't know. What are you talking about? The the crime bill, man. Oh, that was Clinton, wasn't it? No, nah, yeah, but he was a he was a Biden was oh, a yeah. huge oh, yeah. part he of was that. A, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, and he's also like really responsible for our terror war issues as well. <laughs> All right. I mean, we maybe we should take a podcast and just talk about the dirty history of Joe Biden, but um, well, I gonna, don't think there's a point in it. Well, maybe as we get a little closer to election season. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. but then. So what we'll have to do at that point is talk about the dirty history of Joe Biden and then talk about the dirty history of Donald Trump and try and get people to j vote for Joe Jorgensen. <laughs> right. Uh, that sounds like a fun podcast to do. We'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll tackle all three. God, that sounds like a lot of research. Yeah, it does. And we, we know who does the research here. <laughs> yeah, we do. And it ain't me, just so y'all know out there. <laughs> um. All right. Well, we're like almost an hour into this thing. Um, we didn't get to do make any use of the other clip that I, I pulled, but I'm sure we'll get an opportunity in the future. The time, a, a time and a time will come. Um, and so we used to, I, I used to do a oh, quote at the end a yeah. lot. Um, so this is one it's, I don't know. Often it's attributed to, uh, Jefferson, I think it's an old Latin phrase. It's a translation of an old Latin phrase. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, that, you know, we talk about the importance of liberty and there's a lot of people out there that want to, uh, answer a problem that's been created by government by adding more government, Yeah, which I've just, I just don't understand. But um, I mean, there's, you know, there's people out there protesting that think that the answer to this problem is more legislation and more government. Yeah. And it's just, that's the, that's where the problem started. <laughs> and I, I'm floored by this, yeah. but, um, anyway, we may as well throw this little quote in at the end, uh, which is, and I can't do it in Latin, so sorry, but <laughs> it essentially translates to, um, I prefer the tumult of liberty to the quiet of servitude. Oh, absolutely. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we will call an end to this podcast. And uh, as always, follow us all the places that you can follow us, which is like Facebook and... Facebook's the big one. Yeah, that might be uh, it, actually. <laughs> well, Podbean, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. You can follow us on Podbean, um, and then you can subscribe, of course, on iTunes uh, and Podbean as well. Um, and they'll let you know whenever we put a new podcast up. Uh, mm -hmm. of course we, you know, we screwed this up. We did announce that we would be back onto our Thursday thing last week. And as soon as we ended the podcast, uh, Liberty Larry said, actually Thursday might not be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thursdays aren't going to be good going forward for a while. So okay. softball is back in session. Yeah. So. Um, uh, unfortunately through other things that were outside of my control, uh, I am now off on Fridays. Woohoo, kind of. Uh, not really. <laughs> not, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. Um, so uh, anyway, Friday is probably going to be the day that the new podcasts go up. And I like Fridays. Fridays, Fridays are good. Fun. I, I'd rather do it on Thursday. I'd rather do Thursday too, but Fridays aren't bad. You know, because then Friday. we can do the podcast on Thursday. I can start drinking in the podcast. I can get good and drunk by the end of the night, and then I don't have to get up in the morning because I don't have to work on Fridays anymore. <laughs> Well, you don't have to work on Saturday either. You can do all of those things tonight. I know, but there's, yeah, <laughs> but it gives me more time to myself <laughs> if we can we can do this thing on Thursday. Because well, now I have to anticipate, like, I only get part of the day to myself, and then I have to anticipate having guests. Ah, fair or enough. Or a guest. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's just me, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, we're going to, of course, keep this up and try and be back on a relatively normal schedule that will not be Thursday. Yep. 
Um, and uh, we'll be back in a week is the plan. <laughs> that is absolutely the plan. And uh, in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short, look free. <laughs> Ciao. Later.